Hi, everyone. I'm Christina. Welcome to Sona's latest webinar, The Big Reshuffle Part 2, How to Attract the Next Generation of Carers. Thank you for joining us. For those who are here for the first time, welcome. We are Sona. We are the third generation workforce management software built specifically for social care. Our mission is to build technology that makes a genuine difference to the lives of care managers and staff everywhere. We work with customers like um, Evolve, United Response, Yorkshire Care Group, Kishmo, Community Integrated Care, Cutrefi Simru, and many more. I know some of you guys are in the audience, so please feel free to say hello in the chat box. And this is probably the biggest thing that I need to do in terms of housekeeping. Make sure to use the chat because we are all here to have a great conversation. Um, thank you everyone for sending us your questions before this webinar. We honestly got so many. I really hope we can touch on everything today, but if we don't, again, please take to the chat. We'll be running a poll later through the webinar. And of course, feel free to ask us anything you might be curious about. Feel free to interact with our lovely guests. Um, the only thing that I need to say this, the really boring part is that all views expressed in today's webinar and presentation reflect only the speaker's view and not the wider views of their organizations. With that out of the way, I'm gonna pass it on to our lovely guest, Richard, who's gonna introduce our speakers. Fantastic, thank you so much, Christina. Um, just a really small bit of housekeeping for me that's slightly unusual. I have a wife that's currently 40 weeks pregnant as of today. Um, I'm expected to be here for the entire hour, but there's always a chance that I will disappear and hand straight back over to Christina, but I'm sure that won't happen. Um, and whilst I introduce myself and the guests, a good way to get the chat going. We were talking a little bit um, at the panel before, before this call, um, how it's interesting how kids have careers like what do Gen Z and Gen Alpha what do they want to be when they grow up so for those of you in the audience that have got maybe children or nieces and nephews um I'd love to be sharing like maybe their age um and what it is that what it is that they want to to be for instance my eldest is eight who currently exclusively wants to be a Lego builder can't get him can't get him thinking outside of that he wants to go out and get paid to make Lego and if he can do that I would be delighted for him but we'll see how that changes as he grows up but whilst everyone's populating the chat very quickly about myself, my name's Richard. Um, I'm the head of product here at Sona. So I look after what it is that we build and make sure that it makes sense for our end customers. And the only tidbit about me that's remotely interesting, I spent the last 10 years in health and social care. Um, I started as a waiter when I left university, when a care home opened in my hometown. Um, but I spent the latter sort of five years of that career implementing tech solutions and then um, so procuring them and implementing them within the business. Um, and that led me to find Sona, which has led me here today. Um, so enough about me. Um, I'll hand over to Karen um, to introduce herself. Um, and I'd love to understand specifically sort of the why and when you got into social care, given the nature of today's conversation. OK, thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Morris. I work for Skills for Care as a locality manager. And I started working in care at the age of 15. Um, it was weekends only. And then I did my exams. I enjoyed it so much that I went back to it after school, uh, working in various nursing homes and the old, what used to be psychiatric institutions. So I did a lot around mental health. And then I eventually worked for an employer who valued me, believed in me, and really trusted me to do a good job and put me through so much learning and development that I was eventually able to set up and manage a domiciliary care company. Um, those of you that are doing that will know that it's very difficult when you've got young children. So I had to give that up. And then I moved into health and social care training. I managed a training provider for 15 years and then um, went to Skills for Care about four years ago. But I do still work in the industry. I think it's really important to keep current in practice. So I do work as a bank worker um, sort of most weekends as well. That's me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and over to you, Simon, very much sort of similar questions and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, so, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I am Simon. I'm, uh, I, I, 
got a slightly academic title. I'm Senior Fellow for Social Care at the King's Fund, which is a, a health and care think tank, I guess you'd uh, uh, call it, that aims to improve work across health and care. So I'm, uh, I'm very much a policy person. I work on analysis and research and those sorts of, of things. I've, but I've been working within social care for about over 15 years now. Uh, first at an older people's uh, charity and then, as I say, most recently at the King's Fund. Uh, my initial background, uh, this is, I always think policy is my third career. My first career was in sort of journalism and publishing. Uh, my second was in marketing and fundraising, mainly within the uh, charity, the not-for-profit sector, and, and policy is my is my third career. Um, and at the moment at the King's Fund, we'll be doing a piece of work which is looking exactly at younger people in uh, social care. So we're uh, about to publish in, in the next three four weeks um, a piece of work uh, about what providers think about uh, under 25s uh, and we're currently doing interviews with younger care workers themselves uh, to find out what they think about uh, social care so I'll be drawing on both of those pieces of research uh, in uh, this afternoon's conversation. Fantastic the the perfect panel um, for today's discussion thank you both so much um, so I'll jump, I'll sort of jump straight into it. Then I get the nice fun job. I get to throw some questions up and, and have the folks that know a bit more than me do do the answering. Um, I guess I'll probably steer this one your way first, Karen. Um, why are people joining health and social care now? And how how do you think maybe that's changed over the last 10 or 20 years? And just before before I hand over, just to talk through very quickly the slide on the screen, this is showing from our from our survey that we conducted why people are joining and leading leading the way there is personal personal passion and inspired by somebody already in the sector which i think those two things are very closely related myself um and that makes up for nearly 50 50 percent from our survey but it, in your opinion um yeah what do you think why do you think the reasons are and what do you think's changed about that yeah that's interesting and skills for care have recently done some research that's similar to that around why people join social care what motivates them to stay and why do they leave and and the top answer 74 percent of the respondents actually said that the reason they wanted to, to work in care was because they wanted to care for people it was a passion so i don't think that's changed ever you know probably two decades ago that was the same reasons but um what, what is becoming more apparent that working in care is is more flexible than possibly what it used to be you know shifts shifts were very rigid you were given a shift and you, that's what you did whereas now there is more flexibility around shift work um, and you know people can fit it in more so with their family commitments um, and there's a lot more opportunity for progression now as well so I think that's the reason why people are, more people are joining the sector now that's super interesting. I um, will dig into certainly some of those things about flexibility and progression um, later on as well. But I, th I think that's that's very true. Simon, have you got anything to sort of weigh in with here as well? Yeah, um, and as probably not for the first time this afternoon, although I, I agree with what um, uh, Karen's saying, uh, generally, uh, I, I think there's a, uh, there's a couple of other things going on. Uh, which sometimes are unspoken, but we probably need to, to say them. Um, so, um, I, I mean, the, one of the main reasons that people join the sector is because of availability of jobs. We just need to be really honest uh, that in reality, a chunk of the people that are applying for posts are doing so uh, because there are vacancies and it's a sector that is relatively easy uh, to, to get into. Um, and uh, and for some people that's extremely attractive. They may well be driven by what Karen's saying about, you know, they want to work in care, they can see the, uh, you know, the attraction of it, they can, uh, you know, they want to help people, but actually there's also something about this is an easily accessible sector. Um, and then the second uh, reason, and again, is that, you know, particularly if you look now, um, uh, people are joining care from overseas. Uh, you know, the big chunk of recruitment last year, the thing that made the difference to the vacancy rate last year, which came down slightly, was overseas uh, recruitment. So you've got people coming from uh, particular places like uh, Nigeria and, and India in order to work in the care sector. And they're often coming with a, generally are coming with a, an understanding and a, and a knowledge of an experience of working in, in, in care. But there's also a sort of life opportunity there uh, for them, which uh, which people are, are, are interested in. So I, I think we, 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 can, we need to be just 
recognise that people have got different reasons for, for joining the, 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 the sector. And, and although a lot of people are motivated to work in the caring industry, it's not necessarily the only reason why they want to apply for social care jobs. I think that's a completely fair point. It's really interesting in looking at the sort of responses to our survey there. It's a, we say it's unspoken. It's a hard one to cover off. It's like, yeah, why, why did you join the sector? But, well, I needed a job. Um, and I think that's completely fair. Speaking about my own health and social care journey, I dropped out of university and had two very angry parents. Um, I needed a job um, and a care home had just opened. And that's what started it for me, which then led to lots of the other things. And it became a passion. Um, I became inspired by lots of people in the sector, etc. But yeah, it, it is interesting. There's lots of ways in that aren't aren't always spoken. Um, thank you so much. So I guess, Simon, starting with you this time, hiring younger people, I think, can be can be quite daunting for um, for companies. Um, younger people, by definition, less experienced, less proven, um, but also they have different expectations. I think. What do you think the expectations of Gen Z are in in the workplace um and we had a great question in the form about how to adapt social care culture and practices to gen z do you think that's something that needs to happen like what are their expectations are they being met and if not what do you think we need to change so so i think um i, I think first of all i'd say we just need to be cautious about using Gen Z as a whole. So I, I think we do always end up talking about generations and, it, and it's a helpful way of thinking about how a current group of younger uh, people uh, behave compared to, to previous groups of, of, of younger uh, people. Um, and the, it seems that there are some differences uh, between Gen Z and uh, previous uh, generations in terms of attitudes. Uh, you know, there's good evidence, for example, that they're more socially liberal, certainly on some issues, particularly around things like sexuality, um, than uh, previous uh, generations. Uh, there's also some uh, evidence that they're uh, that they're particularly interested in um, uh, in sort of social justice as as an issue. That's a really important uh, issue uh, uh, for them. Um, and there's also some evidence, uh, I think, that they're more likely to be willing to and indeed report mental health uh, issues. So there are some differences. But I think then when you look more broadly, you see an awful lot of nuance. And there is a risk that we overplay those differences and we see them as an entirely different group of people uh, to, you know, to, to how we were at, uh, at, tw at 25 or so. Uh, and um, I think we just need to caution about um, that uh, young people are ex very different themselves. Uh, so I, I actually have got a 25 year old as, as, as it happens. And when I see him and I think about um, my uh, nephews, for example, or my nieces, or I talk to my friends about their 25 year olds, I'm always struck about just how radically different they are as individuals and their attitudes to life and, and, the, and the way that they approach work. So that would be my just general caution um, recognize that yes there are some uh, potential differences that you just need to be uh, aware of but actually what you need to focus on is the individuals and what individuals are saying uh, and how individuals want to be uh, 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 treated uh, rather than applying very very broad sort of quite crude labels and assuming that that's how your under 25s are actually going to act in reality. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I guess a follow up question, um, if I can indulge, um, do you think that perhaps to not put to not try and re put people in buckets, but do you think the the differences um, is greater than before? I think that plays into me, I think, a lot around flexibility. I think you're absolutely right. Treating everyone as individuals. Um, does that increase the need for employers to perhaps offer flexibility? So something that can suit John that wouldn't suit Peter. Um, they may be the same so, so my guess would be that um, flexibility applies to actually all ages of the workforce, but it may actually come into effect in different ways. Um, so if you're employing um, a, 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 you know, a new parent, for, for example, or, you know, uh, um, 
what they might want in terms of flexibility. They will well need flexibility in terms of, uh, you know, uh, drop off and pick up and term times and those sorts of things. So that would be really important to them. But it not, might not be, probably won't be the, the flexibility that someone at the age of 19 or 20 uh, uh, might, might want. So I think it's about finding out where they need flexibility um, uh, and, uh, and, and offering them. But I think it will generally apply to some extent right across the group of, of, of workers that you have, but in slightly different ways. I can't work out if we've lost Richard or... I if, thought um, that as well. Is it, is it, I thought it was maybe me that couldn't hear, but it sounds like... We, we may have done it. It may, it may not be that, um, that, 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 uh, that his wife has got into labour. It may be just because of technical <laughs> issues on the other hand. Um, but have we got Christina? Um, is uh, Christina around? Or Car uh, Karen, you and I can... Um, uh, can yeah, I, I mean, I can continue those. with that question a little bit as well, perhaps about um, the expectations as well around that particular age group. Um, and I think, yeah, there is there is more expectation around flexibility, but like you said, Simon, in different ways, and it's and there's also more expectation about well-being support as well. Um, I've got Jen said and an alpha child myself, and I I would say there's a huge expectation about responsiveness as well, because we live in this world where you know there is this instant communication, particularly when applying for jobs you know, that, that age group are expecting for a response pretty quickly. And I've, I've heard my daughter during A-levels applying for jobs and she sort of said, well, mum, they've not got back to me. And I said, well, how long has it been, love? Two days. And she's moved on pretty quickly to the next, to, to, to apply for the next job. So I think, it, you know, there is no excuse as to why we can't respond to people quickly this day and age. So I think being being responsive is, is really important when it comes to this, the new generation's and I certainly, think I've, I've heard that from the providers that we've uh, spoken to for, for this research as, as, as well, that um, the expectation that, that there will be a speedy response to things, that people are used to actually being able to order something one day and get it the next. Uh, and so that, that sort of sense of speed uh, and, as you say, responsiveness, I, I think is something that many younger people will have. It may also be that actually um, that those of us who are older, 25, are starting to experience that anyway as well, because, you know, we all we use our Amazon Prime services and things like that. But, but for younger people, I guess that's the only way uh, that you've experienced things. That's a really, can, can, am I back? Am I being heard? Yes. Hey, that is good news. Apologies for that. Thank you so much um, for carrying on. Um, I think that's a really interesting point as well. We've played sort of the generations, but it's like as things change, I think you've made the point really nicely there, Simon. Everyone's expectations shift. Um, it may not be at quite the same rate when people are different, used, used to different things, but I think response rates is a really good point. So we've touched around sort of hiring people. Karen, I'd love to come to you and talk more about, I guess, maybe the other end, about retention. Um, there's so many assumptions about new carers, but based on some of your research and knowledge, what are your top three retention strategies um, and why and why do you think they work? And potentially as well, if you could share any that you've tried that maybe, maybe didn't work. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, from, from the Skills for Care State of Workforce report that was published in October, we know that only 8% of the workforce are under 25. So with this de demographic, we really need to be recruiting more young people. Um, and again, it's going back to why people leave that survey that we carried out. It was about younger workers between the ages of 16 to 24 were significantly more likely to leave um, due to a poor workplace, excuse me, poor workplace culture and the lack of opportunities to progress. So um, we also know that not providing a supportive onboarding and induction process can lead to people leaving very quickly, usually within the sort of first three months of employment. So the three top retention strategies from, from me would be about providing a supportive onboarding and induction process um, and making sure that we've got a positive workplace culture and offering opportunities to progress. That's really important from day one so that the, so that the people know that there is potential there to move on and progress. Um, and I think 
with the introduction of the new care workforce pathway that's coming in the summer, that's going to really help with supporting, um, attracting new staff and retaining those that we already have as well. That makes, I completely agree. When we talk, it's always interesting when we talk about sort of progression um, and up, upskilling, I guess, how do you, how do you think about that just to go sort of one level deeper speaking again from personal experience it's interesting in as much as I started as a waiter I ended up leading um, the IT now I appreciate that's very much on the fringes of care it was always sort of ancillary support I led the activities for a while I worked in the admin um, but the point I think to make is that care doesn't have to be this sort of straight career ladder in my experience anyway there's lots of opportunities to do lots of things that do you, do you think that's possible for more people to to benefit from or do you think it's more straightforward that a carer maybe goes and becomes a preceptorship nurse and becomes a nurse how do you how do you think about that i think that's absolutely how the progression should be done it should be person-centered to that individual like we do person-centered care we need to be person-centered to our staff so at, op at supervision all those kind of opportunities we need to find out what our, our staff enjoy doing what's their skill set what do they want to develop in they shouldn't have to do you know a staggered um after a year service you're going to do a diploma it should be about um you know what they want to do and how they want to develop not everybody wants to do lengthy qualifications it takes two three years but they might enjoy doing something that takes a couple of months and gives them that little bit more autonomy and responsibility um, and that is where the care workforce pathway is going to work really well because there will be that role where people can go on and be a specialist in a particular area so i think that's really exciting fantastic i love that little tip like we do person-centered care for for the people we support but sort of person person centered career progression and pathways i really i really like that as like our employees matter just as much um as the people we support and should be treated in the same way um simon very same same question to you around sort of retention how do, how do you look at the world what are sort of some retention strategies that, that you think of them um, that you may have seen work well I, I think one of the interesting things for us is that in the research we've done with providers what uh, what providers said to us was that uh, they felt that um, the challenge of working in social care, which could be, particularly for younger people, can be sort of radically different to things that they've experienced in their lives, that that challenge is a significant issue. And it's one of the reasons that people, you know, may start, but then leave quite quickly. Uh, you know, simply uh, having to work on end of life care, for, for example, if that's not an experience that you've had before, or even if it is, but it, you know, it, it can be, uh, it can be a really difficult thing. So providers felt quite strongly that that challenge was one of the things and I think one of the issues there is making sure that in recruitment people are aware of the sorts of roles that they're going to have to to, to do uh, so you know if, if a role involves personal care my general feeling would be better that people are aware of that when they start the role rather than that becoming a shock and, and we did find people who said you know uh, you know people left because they didn't realize they were going to have to do personal care but then the other thing and, and I think this links very much with what Karen was saying is that um Although that's what the providers told us, our initial conversations with young people, and this is anecdote rather than research at this stage, said, you know, young people started to tell us, well, actually, it's not so much the challenge. We get that, actually. We get that these are difficult things to do and it can be a tough uh, job and we can cope with that the thing that means that we we don't stay uh, is one is we don't get enough support from our uh, line management uh, that you know the line manager isn't around particularly when i'm new and, and i need help that they're not there to, to talk to and, and and help us out and the second thing uh, as karen was saying is about culture uh, and you know what I, it, it, people leave because uh, you know they don't feel welcomed by the either the manager particularly their work colleagues um, so to me, those are the areas that I think, you know, there is scope for providers to do something about and to work on. And, and that could make a, a difference, it feels. That makes lots of sense. I, I want to dig one deep. I'm jumping slightly ahead um, on the script, but I, I find it very interesting. Again, from my experience, how do you make sure or what can people do? And I'm asking this open question um, for anyone, including the chat. Um, when you're short staff maybe you're recruiting because you need more more staff and you've got people to onboard but you're onboarding them because they need it so in theory you've got your nice protected shadow days and they're coming in and shadowing but also someone's called in sick and someone's not there and the manager's somewhere else it's like 
how can you go about and i've seen it time and time again sadly where somebody then left probation because they were like well i'm two weeks in i'm already doing stuff completely on my own there's no support um and yeah i guess i looked at it as an employee through oh, it's no one's real fault everyone's busy but at the same time it's a no they're not having the onboarding experience that they should have in order to make it stick so i guess in in the frantic day-to-day -day that can be in a care home when there's not enough staff or there's a bout of sickness um does anyone have any sort of tips or thoughts about maybe how we structure it so that people do get that support during those important onboarding weeks well one thing i, I, I was with a, a group of providers this morning actually uh, and having this conversation and one of them was saying that they just reintroduced or regenerated a buddying scheme that they'd had in operation uh, so that a new starter is matched up with another member of, of staff whose job it is is to ensure that you know that, 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 that they have as smooth a sort of entry into care as, as, as possible um, and it, it, that, that feels to me like a sensible thing to do it was also pointed out that if you're going to have that sort of thing you need to be uh, rewarding the member of staff who's taking on that that role and recognizing that they're doing it not just sort of giving them that job uh, separately uh, and of course and uh, you know and, and this isn't something that we should get into in detail in this conversation because it will be discussed many times elsewhere there is also an issue about the resourcing within the sector uh, and if actually you know you are understaffed and, and you have difficulty recruiting and you're struggling to pay the levels that that you that you need uh, then actually th there is an issue isn't there uh, uh, about how you can best support people and have enough staff to support uh, uh, people that makes complete sense um just to note we're talking we've moved on and we're talking a little bit about onboarding i can see in the chat there's lots of talk about specifically overseas hiring and overseas onboarding um and i agree with lots of the points that are coming in there i think it's probably worth um possibly even its own webinar as a bit of a separate topic with some of the challenges that can come with some of those things so please continue to share and thank you so much but i don't think um this group will delve too much into some of those specific challenges but also Karen and Simon, feel free to prove me wrong as we progress through the webinar. Um, have you got anything to add on that note? So, okay, so I guess I threw the challenge up about, hey, people are busy. How can you make sure people get looked after? Have you got any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, um, and I think I'm going to share Neil Eastwood's survey that he did here where 33% of staff left because the environment was unfriendly. So it's very simple, fundamental things like smiling, <laughs> um, making sure that the whole induction process is clear. People know what to expect, you know, what is going to happen on your first day, making sure you send out communications about what to bring, where to park. All of those, those things can really add to stress if they're not done. And I think particularly with sort of Jen said, generations as I've had my daughter on the phone I can't find this place I don't know where it is I'm not going you know it's about making sure that everything is really clear um, and, and like Simon said this whole buddy mental thing is really important for, to have that go put go to person um, and it's also about making sure that the hierarchy of the organization are being introduced to the new recruits as well so they're feeling valued from that and then constantly checking in with them all the time so that you're doing probation reviews. Um, you know, ideally, I know we don't have a lot of time, but ideally if we can be doing that weekly or it doesn't need to be the manager that does that, it could be the buddy or somebody else within that setting. But let's find out what the issues are, um, get them to come to the, the probation review with five things that they like about it, five things that they don't like about it. And then you can unpick those things straight away. And, and try and repair anything that's likely to make them leave before that happens. I think that's fantastic. I think it comes down to clarity is, is a lens of like when, when someone's starting, it's like all of that, I think it can be distilled into clarity about where they're expected to be, what they're expected to do, who they're expected to report to, and knowing, knowing as many of those faces as possible, like you say, fantastic. I guess let's flip that same question on its head and back over to you, Simon. Have you seen or um, spoken to people like what? What doesn't work? What are some pitfalls that organisations should avoid when designing their onboarding processes for staff? Maybe things that people think work um, or insights that you may have. So I think just based on some of the initial conversations that we've, I mean, it is the flip of what we've described, really. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that has struck us in the initial conversations we've been having with younger uh, care workers um, is 
how important that people can feel very isolated very quickly, I think, uh, in, a, in a situation situation which is new to them and where the other staff um, uh, don't necessarily welcome them. And, uh, you know, and so I'm thinking of, a, of someone talking to us about going to work in a, in a care home for the first time. Uh, so this was a young person uh, aged around uh, sort of 19, I think. Most of the other staff um, were uh, older, uh, mainly female. And the young person got a real sense that actually they weren't interested in uh, sort of bringing her into the, the, the team. They saw her as a, uh, someone different and they, they didn't want her actually in that, in that space. Um, and as a result, um, you know, she didn't stay uh, very long. Um, the other thing I think is that young people feel that they have contribution to make. One of the things that they think that they can, and I think generally will be, is they'll have insight uh, and they'll suggest sometimes how things could be done differently. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I guess if, if um, you know, for the young person themselves, you're already be advising them to sort of just temper what they say and, and, and get their feet, uh, you know, get, uh, and sort of get on their feet first. But um, actually listening to what young people are saying and the suggestions and seeing whether actually some of that is useful and could actually be uh, uh, adopted. Uh, I, that sense of being able to uh, improve things, I, I think is important to, uh, to not just younger people, but, but many people. So I think listening to people uh, and also just trying to make sure you don't get the sort of sometimes toxic culture, I think, that can emerge in some places. That makes complete sense. I love the idea of the, the listening to people. To, to share a tidbit from, from my new world, from the world of tech, um, our onboarding process borderline gets rewritten with every new joiner. So we have a nice onboarding document. But then as soon as that you're challenged to essentially add something to it, because it's changed by the time we make another hire, even if it's weeks or months or sometimes days, you'll experience something different and you'll have something to add to pass on to the next person that's hired. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily directly replicable in care, but it's an, it's an interesting look I hadn't thought of before. Where it's like, hey, our documents are being written by the people that we're hiring because they, they're the ones that have done it. If you've been the most recently onboarded person, you've got the most experience about what being onboarded in that company looks like um, and things that you may have to share about that or, and fresh eyes on ways of work, um, getting ways to share that, that, that sounds really quite powerful. Um, Karen, I guess exactly the same question to you before we just round off the onboarding. Is there anything that you've maybe tried before or seen tried that, that really didn't work? I'm just loving some of the stuff that's coming in the chat actually about how people are training mentors to um to sort of guide and support new people and I think you, you can't stress the importance of that enough really because you do need what what I mean I've I've been on induction a few times I've done it quite recently in my current role um as a bank worker and I I didn't get the code to get in the door. I got lots of communication about um, looking forward to you starting. We'll see you there at eight o'clock, blah, blah, blah. Um, when I'd been to the organization, it had always been open. There was a receptionist, but going there at 7.30 in the morning, there was, a, there was a key code, couldn't get in, couldn't get hold of anybody. And when I actually got into the building, it was about 10 past eight. So they were like, oh, you're late. I was like, well, it wasn't, I was stood outside because nobody gave me that simple bit of instruction. So it, it, it really is about planning and making sure people are aware. And I think, again, it's development. So to, to start a job and then be told it's going to be a year before you can do any development is quite off-putting for a lot of people. So show them that, you know, straight away that they can develop and this, these are the opportunities for you. That makes lots of sense. I think that, that point about development is interesting and ties back, I think, to treating everybody as individuals that we said before with their own progression frameworks. That for some people, they'll need a year to get their feet under the table and get comfortable before they look at it. But for other people with a slightly different mindset, that wouldn't be right at all. Um, and so I agree, it should be flexed. Blanket rules arguably shouldn't apply to everyone and shouldn't be put out there in, in such a way. Um, I'm also loving the chat, by the way. There's lots of good stuff there around. I'm seeing like mentors almost as like a, a permanent buddy um, or that can buddy all new starters as well. Um, I'm also loving the talk about giving people feedback from we've moved a little bit past um, recruitment now, but the idea of actually giving people feedback that can then benefit them in their future job search, I think is it's hard for employers to find the time to do sometimes, um, but I think it's so important, that especially if you've spoken to someone and engaged with them. Um, so please do keep the chat coming in. And um, we'll um, 
I'll address this one to you, Karen. So conscious of Simon's point, he's absolutely right around generations and not putting people into buckets. Um, and everyone's got different expectations. But I guess the younger generation on the whole, do you think that they have a set of different expectations um, for benefits that should be offered by providers? Like we, um, Simon gave a great example of contract flexibility, maybe for, for a mother um, that needed to fit things around a school run. But do we think that um, the younger generation look at benefits slightly differently? And what does flexibility look like for them, in your opinion? Yeah, I think I think yeah, there are definitely more kind of ex expectations around well-being and flexibility for for Gen Z generations. Um, but that, but flexibility, you know, we, when we think of flexibility, we sometimes just think it's about working from home and getting a bit of time off. You know, it doesn't need to be as much as that. It can literally be about making sure you get enough notice of your rota because that is a massive thing isn't it how how can people possibly organize their personal lives when they only get their rota a week in advance or less sometimes but i i'm sympathetic with employers because i know how difficult that is as well because of the nature of the jobs things things change at the last minute all the time so it's really difficult for employers sometimes to do that um, but that that's as simple as it could be um you know flexibility doesn't necessarily mean to need to be about working from home it, it can be about recognition and rewarding people in other ways um, giving them sort of recognition from an informal or a formal point of view giving them a bit of time off letting them finish early start later and then the whole well-being valuing people giving them praise again we don't need to look too deeply into well-being people respond really well to praise and it can be as simple as telling somebody they've done something particularly well that day that's enough to make them feel better about themselves and, and increase their morale so and i think the most important thing um because our staff are dealing with some of the most complex human issues you know it could be end of life behaviors that challenge intimate personal care um, they deserve to have time for a supervision at least so do try not to cancel that because it you know i know it's, it's something that has to be cancelled because priorities take over but if that staff member's planned for it and prepared for it and is ready to sit down and discuss things it's really demoralizing to cancel it so you know when it comes to well-being please try and book that and keep to it as well i would say that makes lots of sense well-being something that's very very close to my heart in as much as we did lots of research um at sona for like how could we productize it like how could, how could we help that and i spoke to people i mean everyone said they wanted praise essentially um or they want and i was like what, what does that look like do you want your manager to write like are they expected to write to everyone at the end of each day and say all of the wonderful things that you've done and they were like no no i, I just want to thank you um and it, that that really hit me i i heard that verbatim from, from lots of young carers and they were just like literally just a thank you would be amazing um and i was like wow okay um and i know and i'm sure lots of people on the webinar here especially the like minded people that are going to come and join something like this are probably trying to make waves to do lots of that um but it's just definitely worth bearing in mind that a thank you can go an awful long way um, Richard, I'm, i was told a story a, a while ago um I, I think illustrates that it was um during a period of really really uh, bad weather um when uh, there was heavy snow uh, and uh, and co-workers were struggling to to get into uh, in, into in this case it was a, it was a care home um, and the um, and I can't remember actually whether it was the registered manager or whether it was the owner of the care home but they, uh, whoever um, was at the care home gate or door to shake the hand of people who'd actually managed to to get their way in to thank them for the effort that they'd taken to get into the care home and people really appreciated it, it cost nothing but it was just a recognition that someone understood how difficult it was really appreciated the extra mile sometimes quite literally that people had had to to to, to go through uh, and 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 it was sort of recognition of of, of that effort uh, meant a lot to people that's a fantastic story thank you so much for sharing um, before I go on, um, Christine has just announced in the chat, but please, um, our polls now open, um, which I think, forgive me, I'm not entirely sure, I think you put it at the bottom of your screen for 
all participants to go and have a vote um, and you can select everything that applies. But what we're trying to find out is what types of flexibility benefits does your organization offer? Um, so you can take from the options there and submit and we'll pivot, we'll circle back at the end of the webinar and share that. Um, and before we move on, there was a slide on the screen a second ago, Christine, I'm not sure if we could bring that back up. Um, and for me to offer my strongest view that I will offer on this webinar and hand over to, to the guests um, to share less than a week's notice for 23.9% of people's shifts. When it comes to flexibility, and Karen was talking about it doesn't have to mean working from home. I completely agree, but it does mean, to me, having to plan your life. Um, and if you don't know what you're working, now if you work 36 hours, 42 hours a week, and you don't know what those hours are, less than seven days in advance, how are you meant to plan anything? How are you meant to go for that night out to have a nice time? How are you meant to book that time in with the kids and promise them those things? So I just think for me, of all of the research that we've done, that's the one statistic that stands out to me as a very simple way to make people's lives better, potentially, is like, you've got to give people notice of when they're working, in my opinion. I appreciate that's fairly strongly worded, and I don't mean to cause offence or hurt, but I think if I didn't know what I was doing next week, I'd find my life very difficult. Um, Karen, Simon, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I, I don't think I have any specific thoughts driven from uh, social care and the research we're, we're, we're doing. But as you say, I, th I think that must be a basic principle, uh, mustn't it, that, uh, uh, that people will generally want to make their plans a, a week or two in advance. And, I, you know, I do hear stories about, um, you know, people uh, who have got a medical appointment to go to or, um, you know, they've got a day's leave booked. Uh, and then they're rung up the next, at the end of the day before and told that they can't do it or they're pressurised into, into, into giving it up. And I appreciate completely, you know, the sort of pressures of staffing and, 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 and what that, that means and the difficulties it, it raises. But I, I worry that if you put pressure on staff in that way, it starts to feel like not a good place to, to work. Completely agreed. Anything to add, Karen, before we move on? Yeah, I'm not surprised by those stats at all, really. Um, working in the industry, I know that quite often rotors are given out sort of a week before. Um, but not to do it too much for an injustice. I don't think it's just social care this happens in. A hospitality sector do the same as well with their staff. So, um, you know, a lot that, that's how it is operated sometimes. But um, I think also... A lot of staff will have the same shifts. They know what they're doing as well because it, because that flexibility is there now. Um, people are given the same shifts every week, so they know what they're doing, and, and, there's, and there's not much sort of manoeuvre around that. So I suppose 25%. Is it 25%? It's, it's not particularly high, is it, really? It could be a lot worse. That's, true. That's, that's a very useful lens to look at it through. It's also worth noting, having a sneak look at the polls as they're coming in at the moment, lots of people on this webinar, scheduling availability four plus weeks in advance is polling very strongly, which warms, which warms me. Um, so that's positive. Um, but we'll move on. This is slightly more in my wheelhouse. We'll talk about the digital solutions and the impact that can have on recruitment and intention, um, retention. So I don't think at the moment um, or interest in other people's thoughts that it's necessarily I'm going to work for that organization because they're at this point in their digital transformation journey. I, I don't know if people are looking at work going, oh, they've got digital care planning. I will work there versus they don't, I won't go there. Um, but I do start to wonder how much certainly things are, oh, they offer early pay. That's something that's of interest to me. And is, is that going to impact my decision of whether I work there or not? Or is it a benefit once I get there? Um, but I think as tech progresses and as these things become more joined up, it will be interesting to see over the years how that does have an impact. It's like, oh, maybe not even they're just using tech. Oh, they're using that specific tech. My friend works with that. That makes their life significantly better. I want to work for that organization or this organization. Um, and I wonder how much that will start to take shape. Um, for instance, benefits of things like shift marketplace and being able to call my manager's not going to phone me every hour when she needs someone to work. Um, I can pick that up on an app. Um, so it's I'm not going to get called on my time off. It's up to me to pick up extra shifts. And I can. I can travel and work at other locations versus just one. These sorts of benefits to fill 
ultimately they benefit everyone, right? Sharing shift visibility is a really simple way to fill more shifts, which reduces your agency costs, but also it's a way to put carers um, in charge of when they work. A story from one of our Sona customers before I promise I'll phrase this to a question for you, Simon. Um, but one of the one of the stories I enjoyed about a shift marketplace is a medium-sized care home organization. They have seven homes in Dorset and many in the surrounding areas. And just by sharing their shifts, they had one weekend where all of the night, it's quite a niche story, bear with me, all of the night shifts for their nurses in their care home were filled by nurses that didn't live in Dorset, which before implementing Sona at the time, they, they didn't even know was a possibility, right? They didn't know that the nurses in the surrounding areas would travel or could travel, but night nurses got a nice enhancement. It was a weekend, so it's a nice enhancement. People were prepared to travel to fill those shifts. So at one point, all seven homes in Dorset, throughout Dorset, were staffed by people elsewhere just by sharing and asking, you know, do people want to work it? And they did, which I think is really interesting. But to get this to its head, I guess, what impact do you think, and we'll start with you, Simon, that digital solutions will have on recruitment and retention? Well, I, th I think I'll make a more general point, Richard, if I, if I may, on technology, because uh, this isn't something that particularly came up uh, with the people that, we, that we've been talking uh, to. Um, but what one of the really sort of interesting points that when, when we talked to providers about what skills that they thought that under 25 brought, so they talked about, you know, lots of benefits that under 25s brought, um, as well as some of the sort of challenges. But they, they talked about recognising that, that um, Gen Z was the first sort of digitally native generation, the first that had grown up always with technology. Uh, and, and so it just came naturally uh, to them. And they saw that there was a real opportunity to build on that knowledge and that experience uh, in order to improve and enhance the services. Um, and, and there was a really good example we were, we were told of um, uh, uh, so on, uh, it was a, 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 a setting for people with learning disability and they had a, a, a client who really struggled to understand their care plan but made a lot of use of TikTok. Uh, and they had a carer who really understood TikTok and the carer made a little TikTok for this particular uh, uh, person who was drawing on services in order to explain how their care plan worked. And, and the you know, the provider said to us, you know, I couldn't have done it. I've got no idea how TikTok works, but this person absolutely knew how to do it and it made a, a huge difference. So I think the general point I would, would make is that, you know, if if we're recognising that young people do have that familiarity with technology and that use of technology, then for heaven's sake, you know, see where you can use that opportunity and learn from it in order to in, enhance services and improve uh, efficiency rather than sort of regarding it as a as a problem to be dealt with you know the sort of oh well they're always on the phones uh, type of thing which you know again we we did here use it as an opportunity potentially to improve your services and use that sort of skill and knowledge that young people have got that's another fantastic story simon thank you for sharing i know it brings us i think full circle to we were talking about young people have something to offer when it comes to retention and they're coming on it's like hey they think they can offer things and yeah maybe maybe so in this example, anyway, tech was the answer, right? It's like, I, I, I can help with what I know about TikTok in this instance, um, which isn't a field I'm afraid I know very much about. I'd be deferring to, to the younger generation there. Um, Karen, same question for you, for your sort of just high level thoughts, I guess, around um, digital solutions um, and how it may impact recruitment and retention. Um, I think there's, there's some fantastic digital tools around to support with recruitment and I think those providers that are engaging with that are, are probably more successful in recruiting um, you know by not using a very clunky system like i.e sending out an application form in the post um, which does still happen believe me <laughs> then you know there's the people that are not doing that have got more of an advantage there's some really fantastic recruitment tools there's things like the care friends app for referrals which staff teams can all chip into and earn points for referring their friends etc um, we've also obviously got the power of advertising through social media and there's i've, I've just come across a really good um it, well it's, it's more of a website than an app but it's called talk and job and it's about a candidate 
being interviewed by an avatar. <laughs> um, it's not to replace interviews, but it's a screening tool. So if somebody wants to go in at midnight and do this kind of interview with an avatar, it's then uploaded and then the, and then the employer contacts them to see them face to face or meet in, or meet virtually. Um, so there's some really good stuff out there at the moment that, that you know people could be tapping into. And I think with with the digital shift. Um, putting things on a, a shift pack, you know, what you do at Sona with where people can book shifts in advance. That's really supporting flexible working because it's great that you can actually go in and book shifts two, three months in advance. Um, and let's not forget all of the fantastic digital learning that's come about since the pandemic as well. We can now do lots more virtual learning than what we did before. Fantastic. I, I, I agree. I think tech there reducing barriers to certainly job applications um to get recruit recruitment up i think tech can get rid of lots of those barriers and then whilst you're there things like learning and things for retention um something else that we've looked at is like can people actually talking about person-centered progressions with a learning management system maybe they have their core courses they have to do but can you open up other courses if people want to do it and you don't necessarily have to pay for their time but it's like hey actually i can see a course in x I may not be doing it now, but I'd love to do the learning for that and start myself on the way. Um, so again, often it can be visibility, right? And you can start to see what these staff want um, and tech can help to reduce some of those barriers where I don't have to turn up in a classroom full of people um, that don't do my role, for instance, but I can I can have a little look online and maybe, maybe start that course and then also back out um, without any judgment, if that makes sense. I can start and be, oh, actually, maybe, maybe that isn't for me. That's a bit more than I thought. Um, so tech can really help potentially reduce those barriers for people. Fantastic. We have got dozens of questions and thank you all so much for everyone um, that sent their questions ahead of time. If you do have any questions now, please do stick them. I think there's a separate questions section, um, but also I pick up most things in the chat. So if there's any other questions, um, please raise them. Now I'll go through some of the ones that were asked ahead of time. And these are open questions. Karen and Simon, to either one of you jump in. If no one does, we'll be left with, with me sharing my thoughts. Um, so <laughs> I strongly encourage you to. But <laughs> if we go through, I guess there's lots of almost pleas for help um, around sort of retention and recruitment. Um, do we have any ideas about how to source? So one of the questions was about new, what new ideas do we have to source candidates um, and potentially what different tech specifically people are using to do that so it doesn't have to be a tech-based question it can be like how are you where are you sourcing candidates from um, and what tech potentially could people be using to do that are you asking that I, yeah sorry, open, open for easy. i think we were talking earlier a little bit about social media kind of, that might be a strong place to start maybe yeah um i mean i would just say every social media channel you can all of them facebook because they're all going to be different generation we say facebook is for older people um so let's do it for every kind of generation that we can by using every social media and it doesn't need to be the manager that does it again look at look at your person-centered skills if you've got somebody young they're the best people to do it TikTok and all the rest of it and just get advertising and sharing stories it's really good and care friends is that a lot of people are commenting about care friends um it's it seems to be a good one because they're earning points not only for you know referring their friends or sending on application forms they're earning points for for things that they're doing within their work lives as well so if they've done something particularly well at work that day they they awarded points so that's a really good one I'm not sure about recruitment fairs anymore. I don't I don't seem to see a lot of success from those anymore. Not if they're specifically for social care. Quite often if we piggy bank onto others, it works. So if there's a recruitment fair with lots of other industries, that kind of works. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of success just for social care on its own anymore. But I may be wrong. You know, some some people in other areas might have done them. That leads on to another question, I think, around sort of um, the fairs there, which is I'm desperately trying to find it. I read it earlier as I've got my questions on my screen. Oh, yeah. How do we so how do you stand out? I think so a social care um, sort of 
work if everyone's turning up for the same thing? It's like, how, how do you stand out? So how do you stand out as an employer positively above all others in, in the same space? So to take, we talked about why do people work? Let's assume people need a job. People have decided to help in social care is for them. Is that how as a provider can I stand out against other health and social care providers? Did you want me to take that one? Yeah, by all means. I think it's, it's the presence, isn't it? It's having that presence, um, being out there as much as you can, opening your doors, raising your profile. And I think the other way of attracting and, and having that presence is by taking on placements as well. And I'm not talking just about nursing placements. I'm talking about the wide range of academic programs that you can place in your settings and that's paramedic science students it could be ot's it can be social workers all of those need placement so if you take in um, placements it leads to then having bank staff as well because if somebody comes in on a placement and they particularly enjoy your organization they're going to tell their friends and they're also going to want to do extra shifts there as well students need money so engage more with your um, training providers and your employer, schools, colleges, um, and even some of the other other areas like the um, we used to call them the pupil referral units for people that haven't managed to maintain mainstream schools and they've left and gone into different schools. So it's about reaching out to all those kind of areas as well, and that all raises profile. That makes lots of sense. I'm conscious of time there are lots of other questions i'm very keen to leave make sure we've got time for some closing thoughts from um, our panelists and to go through the results of the polls and so with that i will probably hand over um simon first i guess so around sort of the whole the whole topic the main question here is there anything that you feel has been left unsaid any um you've, you've shared some fantastic stories i'm after, I'm after a, a miscellaneous story or something similar at this stage uh, well, I, I'm not sure I can offer you a miscellaneous story. I, I suppose the thing that I would be encouraging, and, and uh, you know, I'm conscious that I'm not in the game of recruiting at the moment, and so that isn't, you know, I, I'm I, I'm reluctant to give you tips based on just a couple of things people have told me. But one thing that has come across, I think, really strongly from our our, uh, our research is um, being willing to sort of enter into the minds of of younger uh, people and reflect their needs and their wants and their expectations and, and you know, and their language. Um, so, for example, um, you know, it, 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 we, we talked a little bit about uh, sort of mental health. We talk to providers who see that as being an absolute expectation with young people that there will be support for mental health issues there. And I guess as a provider, you can either go, oh, that's just too much trouble for me. You know, I, I, I just don't want to have to deal with that. Or you can embrace the, the reality that if you want to attract younger people, then that is something that in many cases you'll, you'll have to, to think about. And I know that's a really difficult thing uh, when, you know, you've got uh, clients who need seeing and you've got lack of funds and resources. But I, I think it is sort of part of the requirement for, for young people. So entering into the spirit of what young people bring and recognising their language and their approach to, to life, that would be the, the biggest thing I think that people could take away. Um, Fantastic. Um, I could, couldn't agree more. Nothing, nothing to add there. Um, and Karen, over to you for sort of any any closing thoughts. I'm going to close with a quote from Richard Branson, which is about train people well enough so they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. That I like. I think that I think that speaks for a lot. Um, a quote, a quote I'm familiar with, but do, do use use often. Um, so, a couple of points again. Christine has just shouted in the chat before we close. Um, we have our next masterclass um, for those that are interested to join. So it's a slightly shorter webinar, but a slightly deeper dive. And that's around sort of your ROI um, for core care solutions. So it's like, what tech can I implement? If I implement it in my business, what sort of ROI? So return of investment for those that hate acronyms. Um, what sort of return on investment can I expect from different things? So what will a scheduling solution offer me maybe versus um, care planning, et cetera. Um, so Hayley will be leading that masterclass coming from Sona in March. And the polls, results of the polls, which um, annoyingly I don't seem to be able to share with the technology at my disposal, apologies. 27% um, of you said that you as benefits that you offer or flexibility benefits, um, scheduling four plus weeks in advance and an overtime marketplace where people can pick up shifts um, 
we have stacked the um, audience with Sona customers. So that could, that could speak slightly to that point. But no, um, it's fantastic that people are sharing these shifts um, and schedules in advance. Um, and then pay slip flexibility, 21% of people are offering. Um, compressed hours is 18%. Um, and there were some others, but I haven't picked them up in the chat. I apologize. So I think, Christina, um, I'll hand back over to you if you have any closing comments to wrap up. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I think that would be all we are at the end of our time. Um, the chat was on fire. Thank you so much for participating in the conversation and sharing so many insights. We'll be sending out a couple emails um, today, afterwards, and tomorrow, in case you're wondering where the recording and the slides will be. But finally, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful guests, wonderful hosts, Richard, and hope to see you next time in our masterclass. Feel free to register via the link in the comments. Thank you all and have a lovely day. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.